Yeah. Well, you had this fire that just destroyed everything, and yet the wall collapsed. Look, there, uh, here's a, a computer model, a computer monitor, plastic, a wooden desk. Look how clean the walls are. And I love this one right here. You can't tell if it's a big slide. But it's a little wooden table with a book laying over on it. Yeah. So it's okay, but this airplane burned up. <laughs> slide. Now, United States Central Command, slide. Uh, a guy named Sergeant Laurel Chavez wrote a letter to an Oklahoma paper and take an issue with the official version, and I got a hold of him. And it turns out that he was a computer operator for the Southern Command and was in their command that morning, and he told me several really fascinating things. He said that prior to 9-11, Dick Cheney had taken charge of NORAD, uh, which I've heard from many other sources. I cannot confirm that. Of course, we don't know that. He didn't admit to it. Uh, and that Central Command was involved in drills on that morning, and he said in his 30 years in the military, this is the first time that their exercises had been classified, top secret. And he said they even had machine guns mounted on top of buildings. What's well, so secretive about their war game exercises? Well, for one thing, he said, the war game exercises that they were conducted involved hijacked airplanes being used to crash into the World Trade Center. And he said, you can imagine their shock and amazement when somebody said, hey, and they kicked on their monitors and showed CNN and the North Tower was burning, as most of us saw when we finally got the word to turn on TV. And they all stand around with their jaw dropping open, saying, how can this be? How can this happen in real life, the very thing that we're sitting here practicing as a war game? Now, these war game exercises, by the way, and I was on to this right away. I was writing about this within days. I was a conspiracy theorist. For a year, nobody admitted to these war game exercises. And finally, a year later, Richard Clark, who was the counterterrorism chief under Bush, wrote a book and he said yes. He said, yeah, we were conducting vigilant warrior, vigilant guardian, uh, tripod. And they had a bunch of these war game exercises running. And in fact, he said when he first contacted Richard Myers, the head of NORAD, and said, have you got the interceptors in the air? First thing he said, well, is this the, is this the real world or the, or the exercises? This is what confounded our defense systems. In addition to these war game exercises, including exercises uh, depicting a hijacked airlines flying into the World Trade Center, they were putting false images on the FAA radar simulating hijacked airplanes, as many as 20, 22, 23 of them. Can you imagine you got 23 blips on your radar screen and you don't know what's real and what's not? And what's a hijacked airplane and what's not? No wonder it managed to work. Slide. <coughs> And just to show you how much importance the Bush administration put on uncovering the truth of 9-11, originally, well, number one, the day after Pearl Harbor, they created a committee in Congress to look into what happened. Less than a week after the Kennedy assassination, Johnson departed his cover-up Warren Commission, but at least he got an investigation going. Two years after 9-11, George Bush was still dragging his feet on investigating 9-11. It was finally the pressure of the victims' families that finally pressured them into creating the 9-11 Commission, filled with his own guys, of course. And he funded it for $3 million, which sounds like a lot of money to us, but in Washington, that's pocket change. Even the Commission said, we can't investigate on $3 million. So he said, okay, and he finally upped it to $13 million. So $13 million spent to investigate the worst terrorist attack, worst attack on America since Pearl Harbor, okay? In 2004, according to the Republican National Committee, $60 million was spent on inauguration festivities for George W. Bush. So they spent four times more on his inauguration parties than they did on investigating what happened to us on 9-11. Now, if I were you guys, I'd be incensed. But hey, we're zombies. We're, we're up here. Slide. So now we know a lot of things we didn't know then. We know that the CIA <coughs> created Al-Qaeda to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan. So if they created Al-Qaeda, how do we know they're not still working for the CIA? 
We know that Al Qaeda moved, moved drugs and trained the Kosovo Liberation Army again under the GS of the CIA. We know that Osama bin Laden was brought to this country in the 80s under the name Jim Osman, and I know this for a fact because I talked to one of the FBI guys who attended the meeting, and they gave him arms and training and money to go back to Afghanistan and create his Al Qaeda and fight the Russians. And by the way, in case you all have not thought about your history, the Mongols tried to conquer Afghanistan and they couldn't. The British Empire tried to conquer Afghanistan and they couldn't. The Russian Empire tried to conquer Afghanistan and they couldn't. What in the world makes us think that we're going to make Afghanistan cap down and grow to our expectations? We also know, and even the 9-11 Commission actually admitted that it was Saudi charities that were funding Al-Qaeda. So the money's coming through Saudi Arabia, okay? And, um, and who was the closest business and social friends to Saudis? The Bush family. Connect the dots. <laughs> All right? They were joined. In fact, according to... Uh, the uh, Austin American statesman and to the people for George W. Bush, it was Salim bin Laden who put up the money to start him in the oil business of Gusto Energy out of Houston, Texas. Oh, that's how close they were to the bin Laden family. And by the way, do you all remember that the day after 9-11 when we were prevented from flying, when nobody could fly, the bin Ladens <coughs> were allowed to fly out of the country. Not according to Jim Mars, according to Richard Clark, our counterterrorism chief. On several different airplanes. On several different airplanes. They were flying from all over the country together in Boston. And then they were flown out of the country. And, and Richard Clark said he was told that the FBI told him that they were going to interrogate him closely before they let him go, but they didn't. Come on, people. Slide. So, well, but if, if it was an inside job and if they blew down those towers, I've been asked quite correctly, where's the proof? All right, here's the proof. Slide. 2009, the Open Chemicals Physics Journal, published in Europe, had an article entitled, Active Thermetic Material Discovered in Dust from the 9-11 World Trade Center Catastrophe. This is a peer-reviewed scientific paper published all through Europe, got lots of press over there, and you hadn't heard a word about it. And they concluded, based on our observations, we conclude that the red layer of red-gray chips we've discovered in the World Trade Center dust is active, unreactive, thermetic material incorporating nanotechnology and is a highly energetic, pyrotechnic, or explosive material. In other words, nanotechnology thermite, known as thermate, available only to the United States military, was found in all samples of debris from the World Trade Center. There's your proof. They blew them down, and then they lied to you. And how do they get away with that? Because there's five corporations that control everything you see in here. Now, I'm not talking about just the news. I'm talking about magazines, satellite, cable, all of them, okay? And they're all controlled by interlocking directorships, and if they don't tell you what's happening, you don't know. Slide. So, what do we do about all this? I already had one person come up and say, you don't see anything good? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll start off with the best thing possible. There's more of us than there are of them. Yeah. If we just get our act together, and get our heads out of the sand, and quit being wrapped up in this, this matrix that's woven about us by the electronic media that's under total control of this rich party, then we can say no. I've already given you one example. The day before Thanksgiving, they were going to mount, try to mount an opt-out program. They were going to say, just say no to those full body scanners. And they knew what was going to happen. And they knew the news media would cover it. And they knew everybody would understand that they could say, no, I'm not going to do that. So what they did, they turned off the machines. Said, okay, everybody, just go around it. Okay. 
Of course, tomorrow they'll be back on again. They're going to tell you you have to do it. Well, tell them just say no. And tell them you touch my junk, I'll sue you. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? My cool work. Two prosecutors in California, the uh, attorney, uh, the uh, district attorney in San Diego, where they got a big air terminal, he said that if the TSA people touch your privates through your clothing, that's a misdemeanor. If they touch them with, that, with their bare hands, that's a felony, and he will file them. And you people need to support them. Did you put oh. things up there? No, nope. <laughs> no, that just that just happened yesterday. Slide. All right, now we're going to talk about the three boxes of freedom. The first one's the soapbox. Okay, freedom of speech. Slide. The problem is, as I just mentioned, is we don't have any control over the media. Time Warner, Disney, Vivendi, Universal, Viacom, News Corporation, and Bertelsmann. They control everything you see in here. And I love what I love, Bertelsmann. Bertelsmann now controls or owns every major publisher in this country except HarperCollins, my publisher, and its subsidiary, Robert Morrow, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, <laughs> News Corporation. Bertelsmann, during World War II, is a privately held German firm held by one family, two families, and in World War II, they were the largest publisher of Nazi propaganda. Hello. And they control now the largest publishing enterprise in the English-speaking language. National Socialism, Nazis, they're still going. All you got to do is just read a little list here. That's just these two corporations, and then you add these in. And as A.J. Liebman said, freedom of the press belongs to the person that owns the press. And the big problem in the news media today is not that they lie to you. It's not what they say, it's what they don't say. You didn't hear about the Chemical Journal article, did you? You didn't see the stuff I told you about 9-11, did you? That's because everything about 9-11, except one thing I slipped through in the back, was censored out of this book. Slide. I was told by an editor after it had already passed the legal vetting, in other words, the lawyers had already looked through it and said, okay, you substantiated everything, at least you got it sourced. Everything's good. Had an editor, and I know it's not his decision. This was coming from somebody higher than him because he was stuttering and blustering. He didn't have any much excuse. He said, well, I think you need to take these sections out. And I said, well, I don't think so. I've got them substantiated. I've already passed the legal vetting. He said, well, let me put it this way. If you don't take them out, I'm not going to publish the book. So I was in a situation where you get what I managed to get to you or you get nothing. Well, obviously, I had to go for the limited hang. So now you did it all. Now, the greatest irony was is that the biggest section he wanted me to take out, which I did, was how the corporate media controls the news. <laughs> and I told him, I said, well, you kind of proved my point, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Slide. September the 12th, 2009. Everybody remember the Million Man March on Washington with Louis Farquhar? Well, that was in the news for weeks, wasn't it, you know? Well, on September 12, 2009, two million Americans marched on Washington to protest the Obama bailouts, giveaways, <coughs> health care plan. And did y'all hear anything about that? No. 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 Washington Post, New York Times carried a couple of stories. <coughs> said, uh, said uh, uh, crowds estimated the tens of thousands. Yeah. You know. They lied to you. Two million people, look at that, stretched all the way from Capitol all the way down here, filled the National Mall. I've seen the pictures. I believe the unofficial estimates are two million people. Two million Americans marching on Washington, and you don't even get to hear that. Freedom of press belongs to the guy that owns the press. Slide. Another thing that was censored out, was uh, that uh, Project Censor, uh, their research team did a 2005 study and showed the interlocking media owners and directors of these five media corporations. So in other words, it's not five competing corporations. It's one big New World Order corporation with interlocking directorships 
and they decide what you're going to see and hear and what you're not. And that's why I say, you all seen the movie The Matrix, right? Okay, well, you're not physically hooked to a computer, but you are inside an electromagnetic matrix woven about you by radio and TV, and it creates a world that is not real. Slide. Jim, yeah. where does BBC fall from? The uh, public BBC. Uh, BBC. British. Oh, British? That, well, it's controlled by the Royal Institute of International so Affairs, which is sister, sister organization to the Council of Foreign Relations. Fox? Uh, yeah. Another thing they made me uh, take out was uh, the, the yeah. fact that there is no Al-Qaeda, okay? I mean, yeah, there's Arab fanatics, okay? <coughs> but, hey, this was all a creation of the CIA and, <coughs> and Bin Laden. Bin Laden's been dead for probably 10 years now. Okay, just like Bhutto tried to tell us, and then two weeks later, she's assassinated, probably thrown in her mouth. Robin Cook, the former leader of the British House of Commons, says, uh, Al-Qaeda literally, the database, was originally a computer file of thousands of Mujahideen who were trained and recruited with, with help from CIA to defeat the Russians. And that's it. They got a computer base, and so they can look up, all right, let's think about Muhammad Atta, supposedly the leader of the... 9-11 guys, okay? We're told that he was a terror, uh, a Muslim fanatic. He wanted to go up and get those 72 virgins. And he's going <laughs> to go to death for Ali, you know? And yet, according to the Boston Globe, the night before, he and his crew were out looking for hookers, drinking and smoking. Doesn't sound like developed Muslims to me. And he leaves his rent car in the airport parking lot with a suitcase in the back seat with a Koran and flight manuals in it. Very incriminating. Now let's just, you know, that's in the news. Now let's use our head. Wait a minute, he's going on a suicide mission. What does he need a suitcase for? Oh, well, he wants to blend in and look like a normal air traveler. Okay, then why is he leaving in the car? Come on, folks. Planted evidence. That's planted evidence. That's the only reason. That's what it's there for. Slide. Barack Hussein Obama, better known as very, very Satoro, Barack Satoro, very Dunham, very, you know he's got 24 social security numbers? We don't know who this guy is. And his school records are sealed. Birth certificate still hasn't been shown. Don't give me this thing about that live birth certificate from Hawaii. I, you can go down to any health department, pay $12, and you get a live birth certificate. All that says is that you were born. And I'm, I have a problem with that. I'm sure he was born. The <laughs> okay. question is where? And uh, by all the best evidence, including his grandmother, he's born in Kenya, which means he's not constitutionally qualified. Well, then how did he get to be president? Because the Democratic National Committee sent out their letters of certification, and only on two or three of them to the more populous states did it say he meets the constitutional qualifications. The rest of them, that line was left off. And because nobody ever thought about it, and you just rubber stamped these things, all the state certification officers just went, oh, okay. And they, boom, he's on the ballot, and boom, he gets elected, and he was never, ever even certified. But that's another whole thing. That's a book in itself. Exactly. His mother, uh, back in the 80s, was working directly for the Ford Foundation in Indonesia under the father of Timothy Geithner, who is now our Treasury Secretary. And the Ford Foundation notoriously was a CIA front. And they were working over in Indonesia on CIA projects. Now, old Barry, what a perfect candidate for the CIA. A young man of color, speaks four languages, has a Muslim background, can travel all around, smart. Hey, perfect recruit for the CIA. Maybe that explains why all these records are sealed, because if they were unsealed, we'd find out that he's just a legend created by U.S. intelligence. When he worked for Business International Corporation, the co-founder of BIC told the New York Times in 1977 the firm had provided cover for CIA employees in various countries. So he's got all the little fingerprints of U.S. intelligence all over him. But we don't know because it's all sealed up. They won't tell you about it. The media won't cover it. Slide. They also knocked out the 25 top censored stories of, uh, of 2009. And you'll notice most of them have to do with corporate malfeasance. 
We don't get to hear about that. No, all you get to hear about is uh, controversies over uh, same-sex marriage and, and abortion and oh, you know, all these things that they can distract us with. Slide. That's because of the National Security Act of 1947 is where it really got uh, started. And uh, we all know that it changed the, it separated the Air Force from Army, created, renamed the War Department to the Defense Department, created the CIA, but what we don't pay a lot of attention to is it created the National Security Council. The National Security Council, if you think about it, every time we've gone to war since World War II, it's been under the aegis of the National Security Council. Well, by its very name, the National Security Council is in charge of anything having to do with national security. Mm -hmm. And that's everything from wars to <coughs> UFOs, right? It's all in the National Security Council. Can anyone tell me who exactly is the National Security Council? It's only four people. Four people. President, Vice President, Secretary of State, Defense. It's the National Security Council. Oops, three of those are appointed by the President. So actually, it's present. This is where we lost the republic. This is where we became the empire. Because the president names the other three members of the National Security Council, and the National Security Council takes care of anything having to do with national security, which is anything they deem in the interest of national security. Slide. Do away with the National Security Act of 1947. Rescind executive orders that permit a sitting president to classify the library and documents of his predecessors. Okay, this is how they cover up for each other. Slide. Federal Reserve System, we really need to get rid of it, but if they're not going to get rid of it, and if you're not going to get enough backbone to say get rid of this <coughs> private banking corporation that's looting this country, at least let's audit it. It's never been audited. Ron Paul brought it up, got 300 signatures. They all, you know, remember last year? Hadn't happened, has it? Does that show you who's in charge? One slide. Here's my original Social Security card from the 1950s. Notice it says, not for identification. Yeah. Look how far we've come. Look how far we've come. Now if you don't have a, hey, I tried to enroll my daughter in college and I was going to pay for it. They wanted my Social Security number. I said, well, why? I'm not going into college. No, we're going to have that. We won't hear her. All right? It's your computer number. Yeah. You've got to use it. Congress should be removed from the Federal Employment <laughs> Retirement System, which is pretty cushy, and placed on Social Security. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Watch how fast they would clean it up. Slide. No intelligence agent, whether civilian or military, should be allowed to run or serve as president since such work exposes them to a world of lies, deceit, misdirection, and leaves them open to blackmail. George Herbert Walker Bush, hello, Bill Clinton, hello, by the way, Bill Clinton and Obama in the same deal. Bill Clinton, remember, when, when he was elected, I thought, whoa, wait a minute, how are these guys in the Pentagon and, and Langley, how are they going to allow this pot-smoking, long-haired, anti-war hippie, you know, to become president? That's because he was posing as a long-haired CIA. He was CIA's reporting back to Card Meyer. Okay, so he's been on CIA payroll all the way back, and so is Barack Obama. They never get away from him. It's the rich party versus us. Slide. Lobbyists. Corporations should be limited to only one lobbyist per member of Congress. I mean, that just sounds ridiculous, but I mean, it's common sense. And if when, those, when that lobbyist visit a member of Congress, they should be accompanied by a public advocate who will argue on behalf of the general population. <laughs> they, you know, those guys go in there with bags of money and double team them, triple team them, quadruple team them, and there's nobody to speak for us. This is why we get all this crappy legislation. When you got fact-finding junkets for members of Congress, that should only be paid for from closely monitored public expense funds, not by people who are driving them back and taking them on trips. Slide. We've got the best judicial system that money can buy. <laughs> we should set term limits of 12 years for Supreme Court justices. Right. Federal judges should be elected by the public and subject only to two terms. 
common sense stuff, okay? Common sense things. Slide. And to curtail corruption, professional politician senators should be limited to three terms, representatives to no more than six. Less than that. Less. But, slide. Of course, to do any of this is going to require law enacted by Congress. <laughs> and the odds of them curtailing their jobs is little to none. So, the vote for Colonel Sanders. Yeah. So, slide. We need to vote them all out. Right. Vote them all out. Here's the problem. I've heard this for years. People go, Congress is a bunch of corrupt homes, oh, man. Throw them all out. Oh, except our guy. Yeah. Uh, we, we got a new fire engine. <laughs> you know, he, he's, he or she's okay. That's the problem, folks. Everybody's been looking to their own self-interest. And they don't think of the good of the country. So every election, yeah, throw all the bums out. Yeah, that's fine. You can't vote for them. But you keep voting for your same old bum. We need to throw them all out. Each and every one of them. If nothing else, you're going to send them a double message that we're in charge, not them, and that they do not have a guaranteed lifetime job. Okay? And yeah, there's no telling who you're going to get in, but hey, at least for, maybe you get a few months, you know, before they get totally corrupted while they're trying to get their feet you know, on the ground. You balanced out, you might, and they might make a mistake and make and pass something in your favor. Yeah. Isn't that the way it was originally designed? Exactly. You know, the, you, you, what we need to do right is you, you don't vote for the party. You look at the person. You see what they represent. You see if they're going to represent your thoughts and your philosophies. And then you vote them in the office. And then you don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. You know how you tell a politician lying to you? His mouth's moving. Yeah. Okay? Because, and they have to. I say that jokingly, but it's unfortunate, but they have to. Because no politician who tells you the truth is going to get elected. If I get up and say, elect me, I'm going to raise your taxes. You going to vote for me? Heck no. So they got a lot to. So forget what they say. Watch what they do. George W. If we had watched what he did instead of listening to what he said, we'd have been better off. And Barack Hussein Obama's the same way. He talks great, but man... He hadn't done anything. All right? So don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. And then if they don't vote and they don't act the way you think they should act, then vote them out. And as the gentleman said, that's not a radical thought. That's the way it's supposed to work. But they're working because everybody gets locked in this Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. Glenn Beck tells me to vote for this guy. Oh, okay. You know, oh, oh but we got to help out the old change. I believe it's not going to vote for you. I'll tell you what, always remember this, man. Voting for somebody because of race reasons is just as racist as voting against somebody for reasons of race. Forget that, man. Go for the person. Slide. <laughs> Joseph Stalin said it. I consider it completely unimportant who will vote or how. But what is extraordinarily important is this. Who will count the votes? <laughs> so we have got the privatized computer voting machines leave no paper trail in the vulnerable hacks and manipulation. One firm, election system uh, software, ESNS, which used to be Dial. Okay, controls actually more now, more than 80% of the Texas students. And there's no paper trail. And this past election should have been a real wake up call that it did. They, they, they're smart. Okay. Now, well, it was close. Anyway, well, the, the, the Republicans got the House, but they didn't get the Senate. And, oh, it's tough. Uh, didn't work that way here, but the thing skewed right down the line. There's one fella up in the Northeast. The early polls showed that he was 15,000 votes ahead of both the Republican and the Democrat. And by an hour later, all of a sudden, he had 3,000 votes and was behind even the Libertarian. How do you lose 15,000 votes? You know? well, it's, 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 yeah, he just kept jacking with the machine until he got yeah. right. Slide. So the only solution, we really have got to return to paper ballots that can be recounted and poll watchers. How many, how many of y'all know what a poll watcher is? 
There you go. Good proof. Of course, I'm, I'm with above average <laughs> intelligence. A lot of young people don't even know what a poll watcher is. Of course, that's someone who's appointed by a political party or a candidate or a concerned citizen group. They can go and has every statutory right to be there at the polling place. Now, you can't say anything. You can't interfere with anybody. But you can stand there and you watch the voting to make sure it's conducted fairly and squarely. We've got to have a shouldn't have a belly club either. Slide it.